Welcome to another installment of Robotic Hernia Surgery. Today we're talking about robotic transabdominal transversus abdominis release. This is a case of a 60-year-old woman with a prior distal pancreatectomy, splenectomy, and cholecystectomy who had a midline laparotomy and a incisional hernia. She had a BMI of 35, was a non-smoker and non-diabetic. In reviewing her cross-sectional imaging, we identified a multifocal midline hernia with a subxiphoid uh, sub component EHS M1 to 3 with dimensions of 10 by 20 centimeters. Her rectus width was rather narrow and we anticipated needing to do a tar. Initial case setup, we went in in the left upper quadrant, assessed the abdomen and felt like the easiest approach would be to dock on the patient's right side. And we essentially started with lysis of adhesions, mostly involving omentum, but also uh, some portions of the transverse colon uh, were involved in this hernia sac. Lysis of adhesions took about 45 minutes. Uh, nothing too dangerous. Uh, I would say that the only Opportunity for improvement in this juncture of the operation was our initial ports being a little too medial and making it a little difficult to perform our dissection. After the lysis of adhesions was completed, we started with a standard retromuscular repair. Um, we'll go ahead and show the quintessential elements of this operation starting by entering into the retrorectus space on the patient's left side. Here I'm highlighting uh, an important element of any of these procedures is the concept of hernia sac recruitment. In particular, early in the case, I like to preserve as much autologous tissue as possible to facilitate posterior sheaths and uh, visceral sac closure. Uh, in this particular case, we recruited this sac, but did not end up using it as uh, we sufficiently were able to mobilize the posterior sheath and peritoneum with our bilateral tar. And so left side of tar, what you're seeing here is incising the posterior lamella of the internal abdominal oblique, exposing that transversus abdominis muscle. And you can see as we go caudal, the muscle goes lateral and we're left with just the tendinous portions of the transversus abdominis. Here, this is a combination of pre-transversalis, pre-peritoneal dissection, as we work in that retromuscular space, assuring that no muscle is left on the peritoneum or posterior sheath. This process of transversus abdominis release can be performed bottoms up or top down. Uh, I will usually just go where it's easy. In this particular case, a bottoms up tar made more sense for me and that's the technique I utilized. You can see there were a few holes made in that posterior sheath. I think a lot of it was related to uh, the uh, lysis of adhesions requiring a fair amount of uh, uh, sharp dissection as well as some thermal dissection around the peritoneum making it weak. Uh, this is something to be mindful of whenever performing these operations is to preserve that posterior as much as possible. Um, in this case it was not an issue to close the posterior sheath defect. So classic flap, uh, transversus abdominis release here. You're seeing us extend this dissection until we see the yellow of the retroperitoneal fat. And I think that's usually a good landmark for at least a, uh, a relatively adequate transversus abdominis release. You can always go much more if you need to, but at least want to see that. Here, this is the upper abdomen on the patient's left side. And this is a subdiaphragmatic dissection. We knew that we would need to perform a subdiaphragmatic dissection in this case. 
uh, as the patient's hernia extended all the way to the xiphoid process. This is a pretty classic area of the abdominal wall, very reproducible. You oftentimes have this uh, fat pad that sits between the diaphragm and the transversus abdominis muscle around the 11th and 12th ribs. At this point, we have a very solid dissection that extends to the lateral aspects of the abdominal wall. Not depicted in the video, we ended up closing all of those small holes in the posterior sheath and then redocked and started on our contralateral retromuscular dissection. Here, demonstrating the dissection that happens around the level of the arcuate line when we're doing our bottoms up tar, and then here showing a more traditional top-down tar, releasing the transversus abdominis. And here we are, again, extending our dissection laterally and exposing the retroperitoneal fat. This process um, went pretty straightforward. Uh, a few holes in that posterior sheath, as you can see, but very easy to repair those. And at this point, we have good medialization of our posterior sheaths. And now we're going to do the subdiaphragmatic dissection on the contralateral side, again, aiming to really develop a space and expose the central tendon of the diaphragm. This is a critical structure whenever performing hernia repairs for EHS M1 hernias. And here you can see the central tendon. And we've done an adequate dissection. Not depicted in this particular case is the unification of the lower portions of the dissection, though that was very straightforward and, and not much to learn there other than unification of that central portion. And here we go, again, uh, a dissection that extends to that retroperitoneum. This is the lateral abdominal wall. And we'll start with visceral sac closure. I use a 3-0 absorbable VLOC. I will run this from the bottom and the top. Um, and depending on the size of the defect, we'll choose the appropriate length of suture. In this case, we use two 12-inch sutures. And this is working from the head down. And again, posterior sheath is being reapproximated. So after closure of the posterior sheath, we then move forward with defect closure. Um, I will usually use a number one VLOC on a GS21. Uh, that was a typo on the previous slide. This was not an OV lock. This is a number one V lock. And we're carefully applying traction to the abdominal wall to allow for this midline to close. And over a few runs, you'll see that the midline comes together nicely. And shortly here, we'll start tying the suture or, or locking the V-lock suture as we sew back over the suture line. Great. So after completing the midline fascial closure, we'll move forward uh, with the final steps of the operation. You can see the midline has been... Uh, reconstructed and now we'll work with mesh placement. We have 30 by 30 barred soft mesh. We orient it in a diamond configuration uh, and then go ahead and fixate centrally with tissue. Uh, I personally justify this 
as an approach to stabilizing the visceral sac. Uh, patient did well, but did require two nights in the hospital. Uh, overall, did great and was able to be discharged home. Thank you very much. I hope that was educational.